Welcome to the party. Um, you're all doing well. Uh, I think um, not much to say in terms of uh, prefatory remarks. Still got that the problem set out. That's due in one week on Thursday, I guess, I class 10. Um, yeah. And then uh, we're, we're getting up nigh on the end of the term here. So uh, I guess we can just start. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have any jokes. Uh, I don't have a type five to, to give you today. A little gloomy, um, but maybe I'll think of some jokes as we go along. Uh, can't guarantee they'll be funny, but they might be jokes. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so last time we kind of almost almost finished up. Well, not really. We 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 see. I think we saw the light at the end of the tunnel uh, for for. Solving the Schumpeterian growth model, which is to say, we sort of we saw the free entry condition. It's just a matter of plugging things in and using what we know, um, and it's it's going to be a little easier than in uh, the uh, expanding varieties of Romer type model. Okay, mostly because we don't have these epsilons flying around. You know, things being raised to powers. It's just you got your profit, which is a function of lambda, one minus one over lambda, and then things are relatively simple from then on. Okay, so um, all right, so let me. Uh, up with my notes real quick. Let's see. Did I? Yeah. So I, in terms of, yeah. So I, I, I put up on the slides. I have the the entirety of the uh, where we have the like solving the model basically. Let me make sure that's true. That's true. And um, yeah. So I don't have the social planner up there. The social planner stuff still living in uh, in the the long form uh, not just growth notes, but that's um, similar. I mean, it's it's it's. It's the, the fourth element of the quadrant. You know, we've done social plan around the Romer model. We've done the the Schumpeterian model equilibrium. So it's you can you can kind of imagine what it's going to look like, and, and it, it looks like you might expect. Okay, um, and then there's some stuff after that. I give you like a, if you if you looked at this as a warning, you know, I absolve all responsibility for for anything after that. But there is some stuff after that from it's just from previous years because basically there's a uh, well, there's, there's a bunch of other models out there that we could go over, right? So I have to kind of pick and choose what, what's what's a good one to cover. What, what are the good ones to cover in class? I think these are, I mean, expanding varieties um, and the Schumpeterian type, mo type model are the two major variants. Okay, so I wanted to give you kind of good representatives of those. Okay, uh, there's this lab equipment model that um, that actually uh, Jim Oglu uses in the textbook a lot. Um, and it actually gives you, it's, it's relatively simple. Okay, but I don't really like the interpretation as much. Um, so I decided not to go with it this year. Uh, but that's in there if you want. And then I think the other thing in there was um, thinking about uh, scale effects. So so think about moving away from the phi equals one regime that we've been basically operating in. And I'll show you in a second. We're going to continue to be operating in Schipeter, Schipeterian world. Um, and uh, yeah, so... so uh, that, that, yeah. yeah. Give it a scrub. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm someone's talking. I heard something. I don't know if it was a question or if it was a just sort of an errant mic. Possibly it seemed like it might have just been errant mic. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So so yeah. The, so basically, the scale effects stuff is like when I say just to clarify when I when I say you know introducing scale effects. What I mean is, you know, moving away from phi equals one. Okay, because when you when you move away from phi equals one, then uh, you get your sort of population growth starts mattering basically. Okay, um, or or it becomes well, it becomes possible to have population growth without. Um, so I guess I, sh I should really say eliminating scale effects, right? I, I, I had it backwards. So let me let me back up. So in the phi equals one world, if you have population growth, then you get, you know, growth itself is, is increasing over time with the population, which is which is not good. I mean, it's really good, but it's not like, you know, good in terms of actually fitting the data, right? So, um, uh, and so, so that's the, the scale effect there is that your growth rate is a function of your population size, which is, which if it's growing causes some issues. Okay, so then the idea is if you wanna have population growth, you need to sort of somehow eliminate or tame or dampen these scale effects um, and that's what moving away from phi equals one does for you, because then research gets harder over time. Okay, which counterbalances 
those uh, population scale effects. Okay, so population keeps growing, but research gets getting more difficult because you already did relativity where you go from there, well, you got to do LHC and that costs, you know, $10 billion, right? And so, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, things, things sort of balance out. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, so so that's the the route that, we, that you take. Is that too different? I mean, it's just basically you posit a different, uh, well, the, you, you, what you, one thing you can do is just say, okay, we have a different production for function for ideas, which looks more like the, the original Jones style thing with phi. And then we just work with that a little bit. Okay. Um, and that's fine because you know, it, it you can, you can tell a story for it and, and things kind of work together. Um, you can also kind of try and do a more sort of micro founded model where you have, instead of just saying, okay, research gets more difficult. You, you kind of flesh out, well, why does it get more difficult? Okay. Is it because people are, you know, stepping on each other's toes and inventing the same thing at the same time, which, which could cause incentive effects or things like that. So there could be different reasons that you could also think more in more, in more detailed way about, but we're not gonna do any of that. So, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe we'll do taming scale effects as a, 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 a practice question at, at, at the end. And, and that would be really, I would just give you a question and, and the answer like last time. So, so we might look at there, but we probably won't, we, won't, we don't have that much time. Okay. So, um, but that's sort of the route that, that you can, you can go down if you want to think about scale effects. Okay. Um, all right. So then, yeah. And then I think that's, I think that's pretty much it in the, in terms of the stuff that's sort of after that warning in the, in the endogenous growth, uh, long form notes. Okay. Um, but let's jump back into what we were doing last time. Okay. So, uh, let's see, that is a gray screen. We don't want a gray screen. We want at least the website. Okay. So those are the slides. We're not going to actually look at those for now. I'm just going to straight to the, the iPad. Okay. So, um, all right. So let's, let's review where we were, where we went, where we're going. Okay. Um, so, uh, back this up a little bit okay so so just to, to go back you know what what stuff do we find we, ha we had this quality ladder model we get we 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 said okay limit pricing is going to happen okay that ultimately implies um profit that looks like this that your your lambda your technological lead which is a one based index uh greater than one um will determine your profit level and the larger the lambda is the larger your profit because you got a you know a minus and a minus one so increasing function gonna look like that. All right, so larger lambda, larger profit, although it converges to, to Y, to one basically, okay? Um, usually I think I think about like your, your profit relative to output, so pi over Y is one minus one over lambda, okay? So that's like a more of an income share kind of thing, all right? Um, the other thing you do is is think about, okay, what's about well, income, where's it going? It's going either to profit or to wages, okay? And so you can find by looking at, by making sure that things are consistent, right? Um, with the aggregate production function, uh, you can find the wage, okay? Which is gonna be related to the overall productivity level Q, right? So this, this thing, I kind of implicitly defined it, oops. Uh, but this thing is Q here, like just the, the exponent log, Logified, the log log aggregator of, of QI is, is capital Q. Okay, I guess it's not that ratio, it's actually just Q, right? So um, <clears throat> that's your overall productivity index. That's gonna kind of determine wages, but then there's this factor of lambda because basically essentially because the, the product markets are distorted, okay? Uh, there's They have monopoly power, they're taking, I mean, you know, the, wor the worker is kind of unnecessary to produce things, right? But they don't get everything, right? They get one of our lambda fraction of, of everything. Okay, um, and profits, the remainder one minus one over lambda are profits. Okay, so that's that's the, the classic labor sort of capital, but in this case, capital is like um, firms, uh, firms profits uh, breakdown. Okay, so um, so that's your wage, that's kind of your income share implicitly, uh, income shares. Um, and then output is much simpler in this world, just Y is P, P times Q. Number of workers you're putting towards production, times the overall, their overall productivity. Okay, so Q is like, Q is really the marginal product of a worker if they're allocated optimally, right? Which is in this case, optimally means you're equally spaced across all the product lines, okay? If you did it suboptimally, well then your, your, your marginal worker would be 
not not have productivity queue, but we're not going to do that. So, um, okay, so, so you get relatively simple answers to things here, okay? Um, and that's that's sort of what we're building on. Lengthy aside on the Poisson distribution, one of my favorites, um, and uh, it's various uses. In our case, we're using a very you know pr particular property of it, which is just that if you, if you if you have this Poisson process going over time, things just happen kind of linearly in in uh, rates. Okay, so if things running at rate tau, it'll uh, a process is running at rate tau, such so as like an innovation rate, uh, it'll happen in a small time step with probability delta times tau. Okay. Um, and you get this form for the value function, okay? And, and actually, I did at, at the end of the day, I guess you know the sort of the the canonical way we write it would be something like this. We usually write it as the discount rate times the the value minus the derivative of the value equals some stuff, okay? Um, I guess I do want to say, you know, this is a particular. This was a particular value function, okay? Uh, in the sense of it was, you have a, con uh, uh, well, you have a full stream of profits, the fact that it's constant, well, it's, first of all, it's not constant, it's, it's actually growing with output, it's, it, because y is growing, pi itself is growing, sort of, you know, at some rate with, with y, okay, so, um, but, but the fact that it's, it's, it's in equilibrium growing exponentially doesn't really matter, it could be anything, okay, so you have some stream of profits pi, uh, and then you have some probability of just getting booted tau, Right, and that's that's what, and then your discount rate is R. Okay, so so that's, you know, any for any stream of pi and any probability of getting booted tau, even if it's time varying, this is gonna this is gonna describe that value function. Okay, so we we've accomplished sort of one case, and it's actually a little bit more general than, uh, well, it, it 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 can it can account for time varying stuff. Okay, so if if stuff is time varying, like if R or tau or pi are, are explicitly time varying, that all gets bundled into V dot. Okay, V dot will take care of it. All right. Uh, so, so this everything we did, we didn't rely on on things being stationary in any way. We we never took a derivative of R or tau, right? We we got a derivative of V and we accounted for that, but we never explicitly took derivatives of the other stuff, and so we're fine. Okay. So, so this it's actually fairly general. Now, <clears throat> the point where it's not general, though, maybe we could make it a little bit more general. Okay, make and provide you guys with sort of a, a useful framework to, to do continuous time value functions is, okay, well, when you get booted, we, we, we got zero, right? You're out, you're done, you're, uh, you're put out to pasture, yeah, you're, uh, I don't know what you do, you're retired, that, and we're gonna normalize it to zero, okay? Um, and uh, we didn't have to do that, right? And, or may, maybe, you know, you get booted and you go do something else, right? And maybe maybe you have a, a, a second, uh, second wind or what do you, second act or something, you know, maybe you're moving around, maybe things are more complicated. Okay. So, um, like, you know, if you think about like a serial entrepreneur, you do your business, like, I don't know, at some point you, you sell it and then you go back to being an entrepreneur, right? So you can think about a value function where you're moving around in states that aren't, uh, what's called absorbing, right? So that zero state can put out to pasture, that's an absorbing state, right? Uh, you never go back, but, but we could imagine a more complicated world where you, you, you do one thing, you try it at some point, you get booted, you do something else. And we might want to think about values over that, right? And that, and in that case, everything's kind of connected. You know, it, it's it's uh, the value function of being in state A is a function of what's the value of being in state B, given that you might transit to that state, right? Um, okay, and then there's also sort of recursive dependence. Okay, so so how does that work? Well, let me give you, I'll, I'll jump back into actually solving this model, but let me give you sort of a, a, a slight generalization of that value function stuff, and then we can go back and solve this model. Okay, so value function stuff because because honestly in terms of the tools that you're going to be using um well if you're doing macro you're going to you're going to be certainly using the stuff if you're not doing macro you, the, the this value function stuff may may also be useful if, if you're doing even if you're doing a micro model uh in continuous time it could, it could certainly be useful okay so um all right so 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 let's say let's do a, a slight generalization where uh, when you get put out to pasture, you get, um, let's just say you get uh, some value, V0, okay? Um, and that might be, we just say it's V0, we don't specify it. Maybe we say that, you know, it, it, it comes from, you know, some other thing where you just have a constant profit stream, pi zero, that you discount at radar. So, so imagine somehow when you get booted, you get, you just, your firm goes into, 
to some other mode, okay, and you just get pi zero forever, in which case your value would be pi over r, okay? We, we can just write it as v zero for now and leave it at that, okay? So, um, so it turns out that, uh, so, so think about the original case that we just showed where we, you know, we found, uh, basically this is, this is what we found for, um, our value function. Okay. So this is, this is what we had before. Okay. And, and you can think about this also, you know, one way to think about this is keep that RV minus V dot on the left. That's sort of always there. Okay. And then we have pi. Okay. And then we're going to have a minus tau. Okay. Um, but let's write it as plus tau times zero minus V, which is still minus tau. I just put a zero in there, right? So we had a zero before that we canceled, right? So, so th this is how I want you to think about this in the sense of, yeah, RV minus V dot is, is just a standard element that we see you discount rate V minus V dot. You have your full profits. Okay. And then you have something happens. All right. Something happens in this case, it's, it's, uh, tau happens okay uh and and instead of getting v from then on you get zero from that on, okay um and so th that's how you can kind of think about this and and so now if we want to think about what happens if instead of getting zero you get some value v zero some terminal value okay so um maybe, maybe that yes yeah, so it's like the value of retirement whatever, whatever you do it's, it's risk-free you know just a constant whatever terminal value okay so um so in that case, right, what we can do is, well, think about how we derived it. So, so this is this is old stuff. Now we're gonna do new stuff with with uh, with v zero. Okay, and this is like v zero. It's actually equal to zero. Okay, so with the new stuff, the new setup. All right. Um, if you think about what's v of t, remember we we wrote it out in discrete time. Okay, so v of t is gonna be delta. Pi, I'll bring back pi of t. Okay, delta pi of t plus, um, you know, e to the minus delta r. We discount things a little bit. Okay, we're just going through that derivation we did last time. Uh, and now we have, you know, something may happen. Delta t might happen. And now if delta t happens, okay, you're going to get um, v0. Okay, you're just gonna get v zero, and that's that's your continuation value basically. Okay, um, and then maybe it doesn't happen with probability one minus delta t. Okay, and in that case, you're gonna get v of t plus delta. Okay, so basically the same. This is exactly what we had last time, but instead of zero in that spot, we have v zero. So your continuation value. All right. Um, okay, and so then, and then we can, you know, we can simplify it just like we did before. Okay, so we're going to get, you know, delta ta, delta pi t. Okay, that exponential we can approximate as as, as uh, one minus delta r. Okay, um, and let's. Uh, what I'm going to do, is I'm going to say, you know, if you look at that term in brackets, okay. With these with these delta t's or delta tau's, you know, basically we have we have some v of, we have one times v of t plus delta, and then we have delta t times v zero minus v of t plus delta that value differential. Okay, so so here it's 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 a weighting of of a delta t and a one minus delta t, but if you rearrange it, you're going to get a v of t plus delta and then a delta t times the value differential. Okay, right. So you're you're starting at v. Of t, at t plus delta, and then with probability delta tau, you have that value differential. Okay, so so, you, so I'm going to write. I'm just going to rearrange the terms inside the brackets, basically, as such. Okay, that and that. All right, so so I, I subbed in for the exponential, just a small small delta approximation, and I rearranged the terms inside that. Um, bracket the, the continuation value okay uh, and then over here we still have vft right so now um okay so and and he, and basically uh here's how it's going to go down well uh this this stuff let's see here this stuff you know the the vft term okay 
that's going to do that's going to perform a, a standard role of it's going to provide a, a an r v term basically and then it's also going to provide a, v, a baseline v to make a derivative over here so that term is going to move over to the left and uh and and give us r v minus v dot and then the second term the delta tau term is going to stay over here and provide the value differential okay so um so how's that going to look so basically move yeah, move that first this this term here over to the left side. So we're going to get like delta r v of t plus delta, and then we're going to get plus uh, you know like a v of t minus uh, v of t plus delta. Okay, so I just moved that you know the the one times v of t plus delta and the delta r times v of t plus delta. Now that's moved over to the left side, and on the right side we're going to have delta i of t plus this thing. So, you know, one minus delta r delta tau and uh, the value differential. Okay. So, it's a now, so now we're almost there. Okay. And um, <clears throat> let's see. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so now we're almost there. All right. Um, we, we need to, to, so, okay. So, so we've, Got it, kind of got stuff on the right side, okay. There's still, the, you know, you ought to remove redundancy generally, okay. Now, think about, remember last time we had, like, if you multiply 1 minus delta r times 1 minus delta tau, you can kind of discard the delta squared terms, right, and you end up with 1 minus delta times r plus tau. You can discard the delta squared terms. Here we have some, del we have, well, one delta squared term, at least, in this uh, term here. You know, so this is basically delta tau minus delta squared r tau. And that delta squared is going to disappear. So essentially, this, this one minus delta r term is, is, is going to disappear, okay? Because it's, it, 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 you know, we can, we can drop any quadratic or more terms in delta okay, sort of at will, okay? Um, and then similarly, stuff like this here, because we have a delta, which is already making this kind of first order infinitesimal. The fact that this is at t plus delta isn't really going to matter. Right? That that's kind of like a delta squared term. It's not as it, it it doesn't jump out as a delta squared. But for instance, if you just if you took a Taylor expansion of this, then it it actually would be a delta squared term. We're not going to do that because we don't have to. But but essentially, it's harder to see here. But th this actually is is essentially um, has two deltas and one of them, in particular, this plus t is is going to drop. Okay, so so I guess the yeah, I mean pro probably the best way to um, the best way to, to, to do it is you just divide right now, and then we'll see how, how it works out. Okay, so so let's divide this by delta, and then see what happens. Okay, so when we divide by delta, we're going to get um, R V of T plus delta plus uh, this term, which is actually, well, it's, it's minus the derivative because the delta is on the right-hand side, but that's fine. Uh, pi of T. Uh, so here we're going to get one minus delta r. That delta doesn't get canceled yet, but the delta will cancel there on tau. Okay, so we're still good. Um, and then we have this value differential. Okay. All right, so we divided by delta, and now we just have to take a limit and hope for the best. Okay, and it turns out that things work out. Okay, so if if, if we take a limit. This delta goes to zero, that's delta. Um, what do we get? Well, so we're gonna get what? Rv of t, okay? Minus v dot, all right, because that's a t minus t plus delta, it's a minus v dot, okay? Um, pi on the right-hand side here. Now that, that one minus delta r, it just becomes a one. There's nothing, nothing, nothing pulls up. It's all good, right? So it's just gonna be plus tau, times v0 and then that v of t plus delta again that that that's one of those sort of like it's a delta that that doesn't end up mattering that much okay so it'll, it'll just be v of t okay so this is what we get in the end okay so this this v of zero this v of zero minus v okay so what we get is rv minus v dot the standard thing the flow utility or flow profit in this case pi um and then an event which happens with with flow rate tau, okay, times the value differential. 
Okay, so it's different from discrete time where you have the probability of the thing happening times the continuation value, right? You here you have the the difference between the continuation value when it did happen versus what would have happened what you would have gotten if it didn't. So the value differential, right? So it's not v it's not v zero there. It's v zero minus v because it's the differential. Okay, it's just I don't know if there's there's no I can't think of a deep philosophical reason for that, but it it's. It's the way things are. I mean, essentially, if uh, if if you had a transition, a state transition where nothing changed, you just like, oh, I'm in, I went out to pasture, but actually, I still have a profitable firm. I'm just in the pasture now. Um, you know, v would be the same. That term shouldn't affect anything. In which case, you get v minus v, right? And so you get it wouldn't show up because it's just you're just relabeling your state, right? Um, so. So this, the, the state transition should only matter if they happen with positive probability, so tau is positive, and it actually changes something, which means that V0 is somehow different from V, okay? If either of those two things don't hold, well, then this shouldn't have have any influence on your value function, okay? So so that's kind of why you have the, the value differential instead of the value itself, okay? Um, all right, so so that's the first so so and then you can see you know if, if you had v0 equal to zero our state our case before then you revert to you know what we had okay um but what you can see is well now we can handle sort of arbitrary state transitions right so v0 need not be a number okay that's just some okay that's your continuation continuation value it could be oh actually we we did an ipo or something or you know the the the, the state of our firm changed uh, a competitor entered the state of the market changed, which is going to affect our profits, right? And a competitor exited, right? So any of these events that can happen, you, if you can assign a flow probability to them, then you just, you know, then you'd have some definition for V0. And so here's what happens with V0. And, and it, you know, you'd have events that can happen, state transitions and value differentials. Okay, so you can, uh, you can define um, just like kind of with the Markov stuff and value functions where you have different states and you're jumping between them. You can do the same thing here. You have different states, you have different flow rates at which you jump between them, and you, you can assign and calculate value functions for them. Okay. Um, all right. And so, so that's that's pretty much it. You, you can you can ramp this up sort of arbitrarily because you, you could have another thing that happens to you with flow rate mu where you get v1 or something else, and you'd you'd show up and you'd get another term that would show up linearly independently from that because Poisson. Uh, processes over short time periods don't both happen at the same time. Okay, so you you can just add on events, right? If, if there's other stuff that can happen, just find the flow rate and and throw in a value differential. Okay, so you can you can um, uh, ramp up the complexity of this sort of arbitrarily. Okay, um, all right. So that's sort of the general, slightly more general theory of of how to evaluate um, continuous time stuff in in uh, with with stochastic processes, basically, in this case, a Poisson process, okay? Um, yeah, if we have time, uh, maybe like, I guess next week, um, then we, we may, we, we may actually have time. Uh, we can do stochastic, pro like, um, can, like, sort of truly stochastic processes in the sense of this is, these are Poisson processes, so there's stuff that happen most of the time, they don't happen, right? Most of the time, that you're not getting booted out, and then at some point in time, you do. Okay, it's just and that's it's so it's a discrete event, sort of like a jump process. Sometimes people call it. Um, the alternative is is a more truly continuous thing that's moving around over time. So think about taking a random walk in discrete time, and you jump up or down in every time step, and it's cumulative. And then think about taking that and looking at a continuous limit, right? where in every single instance, you're jumping a little bit, right? That limit is called Brownian motion. And that's really where you're, you're moving around continuously. It looks sort of like a stock price ticker uh, index, uh, ticker plot or whatever you call it value, the, the, when you plot the value of a stock over time. Okay, so um, that that's a little bit more complicated, okay? Um, because you need, to, you need to worry about the continuum and how everything kind of looks in the limit, but um, it can also be useful. Uh, so yeah, we may do that next week if we have time. All right, but we don't need that now. Okay, we all, we we actually just need this one tau thing. Okay, and that that's all. All right. So let's jump back to that. Okay, so um, okay, so we're jumping back to Schumpeter. 
Okay. Um, yeah. So so let's let's recap. Okay. So we we found your profit, right? Which is a function of lambda and y. Uh, what else did we found? We we found um, that w is q over lambda. Okay. Um, All right, and this and and in particular, this implies that uh, WP plus pi is equal to Y. All right, because if you if you if you think about WP, tack a P on here, you're going to get WP is equal to QP over lambda, which is Y over lambda. And if you add those two together, you get Y. Okay, so that's a, a labor income breakdown. Sorry, a, a, a total income breakdown in terms of how, where, what goes to production labor, what goes to profits. Okay, and then you can kind of wedge research labor into both of those, like we did last time. Okay, um, all right. So this, that's what we got there, and then y. Okay, so I just alluded to is equal to p times q. Okay, um, and then I guess the the last thing we did last time was the the value function. Remember, we, we found that the value function was, well, in, in general, that value function is going to look like pi over r plus tau minus gv. OK? If you, if you do that trick where you divide by v, OK, you're going to get pi over r plus tau minus gv. Okay, so that's sort of that's sort of what we found last time. Okay, and then and then we can we're gonna impose. So so that's the the total product market outcome profits values. We're ready to do for entry basically. Okay, now <clears throat> let's do it. Okay, um, there we go. So we got a good amount of space here. So free entry. Uh, well, to do free entry, we kind of need to know. Your production function for ideas okay and so in this case uh that's going to be basically you need to know what is tau okay um and in, in this case we're going to have tau is going to be gamma times r okay so but I, I i'm still using gamma let me make sure that i did this right yeah okay so yeah so gamma just like before is our sort of overall rate uh, uh the pro probability that an individual researcher is successful basically okay over a short amount of uh, flow probability really that they're successful okay um and so gamma gamma can be greater than one for instance right so so because we're in a flow probability world continuous time these so-called probabilities are just positive numbers okay um all right okay and so and that's that's an r it was supposed to be an r let's make it like a proper r Okay, um, right. So it's very just the simplest possible production function you could imagine: linear, constant, uh, marginal product, whatever. Um, okay, and so so now, as an aside, okay. Well, th there is the question of how does this map back into the Jones taxonomy? Because with n, it was it was clear n corresponded exactly to a. It was our our, our overall level of technology. Okay, now here, okay, uh, q is our is our technological factor basically? I mean that that determines labor productivity and everything. Um, so so then the question of there's a question of well what's 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 the you know how, how is Q growing? Okay, how is Q moving around over time? Okay, um, and and essentially I'm gonna we're gonna see that it's that I haven't shown you this yet, but we're gonna be able to show that it's gonna look like this. That Q the, the growth rate of Q is gonna be log of lambda times tau. Okay, so it's going to be some product of, of the step size of innovation and the rate of innovation. Okay, uh, and so that's that's how it, when we can go back then and say, well, what is it? Where does this lie in the Jones taxonomy? Okay, and it turns out it's going to be also phi equals one. Okay, um, because essentially, if you um, if if that's true, then this means that Q dot is equal to log of lambda times Q times tau, okay, which is going to be, you know, gamma log of lambda 
Q R. Okay. How dangerous is it that I don't think I know what the Jones taxonomy is? Uh, not, not too dangerous. It's um, okay. uh, maybe I didn't. I don't know. Remember if I if I, no, I you 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 know what it is. Maybe it's just I'm using a different word for it. It's just the when we wrote this uh g sort of generic type of semi endogenous growth model, okay, and then you break it down. So this is this is your production function for ideas for some abstract technological factor A, okay, and then we looked at like okay when phi is less than one. Then you end up with that you, know, you you can show that the 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 growth rate is going to look like this okay if you have a population growth and then when phi equals one the growth rate is going to be you know g is going to be gamma r to the eta and then phi greater than one you get um you know singularity so so basically is that that semi endogenous growth thing where you just you're just talking about the i the, the uh, the the concept of a, a production function for ideas and what it the you know a somewhat general functional form for it and and how you know what are the implications in, in that space basically right and so then usually for these these endogenous growth models you can come up with like what's the effective phi okay and so here you know so here uh, our, and since our q kind of became this optimal productivity of the workers it pretty well maps into what's going on with this uh, yeah yeah okay. so so q q basically is a now okay and then if you like okay what's we have a q you know this is this is q dot here so what's what's the what's this is your phi right and in this case there's just a one there right so the the rate of change of your technology parameter is linear in it the technology parameter itself, and so that means your your phi is one. Okay, we could have had if there was something different there, then it would you know it'd be some other phi, right? But but in this case, the effective phi is is one. Okay, and then and then if you look, you know same thing, eta here is is also one. Okay, so we're in a phi equals one and eta equals one world with this particular model. Okay, um, yeah, and then before. Uh, in the the Romer uh, expanding varieties model, okay, there we actually just assumed this production function right off the bat. We just said mm -hmm. it gets you know you, we're just throwing in the end, okay. It just you know you, there, there's some scaling, okay, where if you uh, you build on old technology in such a way that you have basically that, and so this is also phi equals one. Uh, Eta equals one. So we just assume that basically right off the bat. So, so in the Romer world, you know, we wrote down the production function. It really just was sort of like a one to one mapping. Uh, in this world, because oh, we, we have to sort of endogenously think about what's the, the productivity index and we have to think about, well, how do we define that? But once we do that, then you can see that it actually is, it's still a phi equals one, eta equals one world. Right. Um, so, so pro probably, it, probably in, maybe in the final review, we'll see a problem where we, where we break that. Okay. Where we, where we say, okay, well, what if you threw in a phi here, for instance? Okay. Yeah, or, or that's okay. You, you don't have to. It's, it's yeah. You, you don't want to do it? All right. <laughs> no, no uh, it, it's not so bad. It really isn't so bad, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. But for now, let's, let's, let's stay focused on phi equals one, because that's going to be simpler. Okay. Um, all right, so so this is our okay. So we're so this this for now that that stuff this stuff on the right we're going to worry about in, in a minute. Okay, for now we're just gonna we're gonna solve the model, figure out what basically R and what tau and G are. Okay, so well this is G. We're gonna figure out what tau what R is and then tau and then G. Okay. Um, all right, so now what's you know we can always derive a free entry condition from our production function for ideas. Okay. So in this case, think about you're you're a worker. You can either be a researcher or a, a production worker. Okay, um, and if you're a researcher, well, you successful with probability gamma, full probability gamma, uh, and you if you're successful, you get you get the firm. Okay, you you sell the idea to someone who makes the firm and compensates you fully for that idea. Okay, so gamma v. Okay. And then that should be equal to your other alternative, which is being a production worker, worker in which case you for sure get uh, <clears throat> uh, a flow, you know, wage and uh, consumption of uh, W. Okay, so 
yeah so you're risk neutral it, it, embedded in here is uh let me see what's embedded in here is that you're rich yeah yeah, yeah it's, uh, maybe i shouldn't say that you're a person because re really you're an entrepreneur of some sort you're, you're more you're more of a firm like person uh in the in the mitt romney sense uh corporations are people uh so you're um yeah you're risk neutral because you have that value b implicitly you are evaluating your potential future profit stream uh with discount rate r meaning you can you can freely say you can freely borrow that rate r right so it's, if you're valuing that profit stream pi at, at uh, with r with the interest rate that means that basically you can borrow because um <clears throat> well you need to let me think there are okay so there aren't really capital i mean th think about it, you're an entrepreneur you're, you're paying the researchers right uh to do this research and they're not going to be successful immediately okay they're gonna be successful at some point okay so you're gonna you're, you're digging a hole right and you're hoping that they, they come up with something eventually they do and then they get that profit stream and then they get you out of the hole right so so you're 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 um you're gonna need probably to borrow up front to to run this operation okay so so the implicit assumption is that you can actually borrow you're not credit constrained and and you're you're kind of evaluating things in a risk neutral way okay and uh and that you can't go bankrupt basically which is not not the case right so there, there's there's details in here that aren't true okay they're not they're not accurate okay uh there's simplifications okay but this is the this is the simplest way to approach it for now okay um all right so so gamma v equals w that's our financial condition okay so now we kind of have <clears throat> mostly everything we need okay so uh just looking up top you know we we, we know w basically uh v is kind of just a function of pi which we know they're all kind of related and right so remember pi if, if we plug in for y is this thing times q times p right so so it, it's all kind of there okay uh the the one thing we we might worry about which we, we were we, we had a good bit of trouble on the roman model which was gv okay now gv is much more friendly in this model okay okay because uh so first let's you know this is important we'll get we'll come back to that now if we can figure out gv then we really are all set okay so what is gv now, if, if the Fianchi condition holds, that automatically means that GV is equal to GW. Okay, so let's let's assume that it holds for all time. Okay, uh, so that's equal to GW. And then um, <clears throat> if you look up top, you know W is Q over lambda, right? So then GW is just GQ, which 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 we're going to call just G because Q is our main technological index. Okay. Um, so that's it. GV is just G, okay. And um, let's see. Uh, well, okay. We don't know what G is. Well, we I've told you what G is, but we haven't shown that that's G. Uh, but let's just keep it as G for now, and then we'll we'll sort of tie up that loose end. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Okay. It, it, yeah. So actually, I, I said it's, it was going to be a problem. It's not a problem. We'll see in a second. Okay. So now that's GV. Okay. It's just G. Okay. And if you think about that denominator, R plus tau, I'm doing, okay. Uh, minus G. Okay. Minus GV, which is, which is G now. Okay. Uh, then we can plug in the Euler equation, right? Right. And remember the, the Euler equation uh, for a log utility world, let's assume log utility, uh, is going to say that R <clears throat> is equal to rho plus GC, right, which is equal to GY, because you consume what is produced, and GY in a steady state is just going to be equal to G. Okay, so look up top here. <clears throat> Q is powering our growth. Okay, assume we're in steady state. Okay, I'm not. I'm not going to go through the whole. P might be moving around over time thing. Okay, because we did we did that last time. It, it's a hassle, right? Um, we we know it's going to come. It's going to work out the same way. So it, outside of steady state, yeah, P could be moving around over time 
although when you actually solve it, it doesn't. In steady state, if you just assume it right off the bat, we can say P is not moving. It's stationary. Some fraction of people are doing production, some are doing research, and we're, we're looking for that number, okay? So in steady state, assume we're there, <clears throat> uh, then you know we just the growth of Y is, the, is coming entirely from growth in Q. So then GY is equal to GQ, which is G. And we consume, we just consume what it's produced. Very simple game. So then, so then uh, GC is GY is GQ is G. Okay. So at the end of the day, what that means is that, you know, uh, uh, rho, sorry, R is rho plus G. Okay. So our, our Euler equation really, you know, is R is rho plus GC, which is equal to rho plus G. Okay, so things turn out to be sort of conveniently very simple in terms of the growth rates. Okay, and once you have that Euler equation, this on uh, this thing on the bottom, r plus tau plus g. Well, then it's that's just rho plus uh, tau. Okay, so r the r minus g turns into rho, and then we still have the tau sitting around. Okay, so we're we're just left with uh, rho plus tau. Okay, so so the, the good thing is just that like that GV term cancels the g inside the inside r because we're in steady state and because we assume block utility. So we don't have the theta flying around because theta is one. Okay, so if we were in CRA, general theta land, then we'd, we'd have a, a theta minus one term and it'd be a little more complicated, not, not catastrophically so, okay. But if we assume log utility, then we, we, we don't even have to worry about G, okay, uh, in, in the solution, okay. Um, all right, so, okay, so that, that Simplifies things, okay, and so so in particular, you know that means that if we look up here, that this is going to be pi over rho plus tau. So that's our that's v. Okay. Um, all right. So that's uh, yeah. Okay. So now now we basically we, we really do have everything. Okay. So let's um, well, I'm going to jump to a new page. We we have room. so so they, they this is how. This is how the algebra is going to work out. Okay, we're going to have gamma v is equal to w. Okay, and that means that gamma i over uh, rho plus tau is going to be w, and remember w is is uh, q over lambda. Okay, so I'm just kind of using stuff from from that previous page okay and then we can keep plugging in okay i'm gonna, I'm gonna go right here for, for no reason in particular uh this is plugging in for pi it's one minus lambda inverse times y oh dear that wasn't good over uh rho plus tau is equal to q over lambda okay let's jump to the next line for no reason in particular uh we so we know what y is okay that's Q times P over rho plus tau. And, and we actually know that tau is is gamma times R, right? Remember that's our production function for ideas, gamma times R. Okay, so now we're kind of almost there. Okay. Um, all right, so, so, I mean, right here we can see like Qs are gonna cancel, right? Uh, we can we can move a lambda over. We can basically cross multiply. Okay, and we're gonna be left with gamma times lambda minus one times p is equal to rho plus gamma r. So cancel the q's, combine the lambda terms, and sort of cross multiply, and we're gonna get that. Okay. Um and here we can base now we can basically solve for, for r, let's say. All right, because that P is just one minus R. Okay, so it's gonna be gamma lambda minus one, one minus R is equal to rho plus gamma R. Okay, so now this really is a single equation where we have R and, and a bunch of parameters. In, in this case, uh, rho, gamma, and uh, lambda. All right, so we only have three parameters. Okay, so we just have to solve for R. Um, what do we get? 
well, not particularly exciting. Let me just, you know, you're going to get some partial cancellation, but at the end of the day, uh, you're going to get um, gamma times lambda minus one minus rho over uh, gamma times lambda. Okay. Let's see if that's the right answer. That's the right answer. Okay. All right. So then uh, that's what the slide said. So then, uh, okay. So that's our, that's our solution for R star. All right. Um, and uh, well, I don't know. Okay. I mean, you, you can write this 10 different ways. Okay. You know, if, if you, if you divide through, if you want, I mean, you can write it like this, something that looks like that profit share minus basically rho over lambda gamma. Okay, so I don't know, the, the, the research is, you know, some, some function of that lambda profit share, okay, minus something involved in a discount rate, okay? So, I mean, you can, in terms of comparative statics, okay, it all kind of makes sense, which is a higher discount rate means less research, okay? Um, <clears throat> a high, uh, higher gamma, more productive research actually means more research too, okay, that makes sense. And then uh, now lambda, okay. Um, well, that one might be tricky because we got a we got a lambda on the top and we got a lambda on the bottom. Let's see. Uh, actually, it's like so. Uh, but I think it I think it's increasing because if you look at the right hand term at the, at the end, that profit share that's increasing in lambda. And that's gonna that's some curve that's converging to one. Okay. Uh, and then the second term <clears throat> is also increasing in lambda because you're subtracting one over lambda. That's something. Okay. So this should, this whole thing should be, um, uh, increasing in lambda. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. So then that all, you know, and, and lambda is, it's kind of like a productivity. You know, it's how big the innovations are. So, so you would expect that, right? Um, okay. So now... This is R, okay, and then we want to jump. The, the first thing we can do is jump into well, what is tau, okay? So tau star. Well, that's just that's just gamma times R star. So that's just that's you know directly going to kill off um, that one gamma factor. So you know we'll have you know gamma lambda minus one minus rho over lambda now. Okay, so we just get a we just kill off a, that gamma term. Okay, um, all right, and then. Uh, yeah, so that's how that's our innovation rate. That's how how uh, you know over a year period this says this is how many innovations happen, or this is the fraction of product lines in which an innovation happens. And in that in that case, you get displacement or, or what we would call it disruption, I guess, uh, in modern parlance, right? So um, so that that's kind of a concrete notion, okay? Uh, and maybe you can you can quantify that in, in the data, right? Um, and, and R, I mean, R is a concrete notion too, that you could, you could look at the fraction of people there, some, however defined doing research work. Okay. So, um, yeah. Uh, and then the other thing is, is as before, this is some, you know, because of some of the, some of the linearity assumptions we made, this thing can hit zero. The, the R and tau, they can hit zero for certain parameter values, in which case you just don't have research going on. Okay, so probably not the most realistic thing because, you know, um, something you, 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 something about that linearity and production maybe isn't so realistic. Uh, but, you know, I mean, you think about it, like <clears throat> how much research was there in the year 1000? Um, some, okay. I, I think a lot of it was going on in, like, in the Arab world at that point, uh, like around Iraq, but... You know, in a lot of places, not that much research. Okay, so um, maybe that maybe that's how to interpret it. But 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 in the modern world, I, I think you know this is probably just a, a misspecified production function of some sort. Okay, so we're going to kind of assume though anyway that we're we're in a regime where you have positive growth. Okay, um, and and that's just a parametric assumption. In this case, that would mean you know gamma times lambda minus one is greater than rho. Okay. Um, Okay, so then, so that that's our innovation rate, and then the final thing is is the growth rate, which is kind of the main variable of, of interest or output variable we might want. Okay, so there we, we need to do a little bit, okay, because uh, it's it's not so obvious. Okay, and so so our growth rate, remember, is we're looking at 
what's going on with Q. Okay. Um, and yeah, so then, well, now first we need to know well, what is Q. Okay. Uh, well, well, first let's say note that as we discussed in the past, that the growth rate is Q dot over Q, but it, you know it's also the the time derivative of the log of Q. So d log q dq, d log q dt, right? Chain rule in that baby, you're gonna get one over q times q dot, which is the growth rate, okay? So, um, <clears throat> and that's gonna be useful because, because you know, for our particular case, because the way we defined it was that, you know, the log of q is the integral of all, uh, the log of all the little q's, okay? So what, when I read originally, it was q is e, the exponential of, the thing on the right, if you take a log of both of those, you get that the log of Q is the integral of, of, of all these, the log of the QIs. Okay. Um, so that, that's why I call it a log log aggregator because those are the log on both sides. Okay. So um, now this, and this is useful because now we can look at the derivative, the time derivative of that log Q, and that's going to be our growth rate. Okay. So let's do that. Okay. So, so now, uh, yeah, so now that's, this isn't so obvious. I mean, what happens, I mean, what, you take a derivative of log Q, okay? And then we know how the integral works. We, we take a derivative of all those QIs with respect to time, but then they're all little Poisson processes that are maybe jumping or maybe not. So generically, the vast majority of them are not going to be jumping, right? Like with probability one, Basically, an individual queue at a given time will not jump. Okay, so there's kind of a limit thing that we need to, to, to think about. Okay, and it, it's kind of like you got two limits and they're gonna kind of cancel in, in, in just such a way. Okay, but the way to approach it is just like what we did with the value function. It's to do it in discrete time and take the limit. Okay, and use what you know about Poisson processes. All right, so, so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say log. Now, uh, I'm gonna drop those parentheses of log of q at t plus delta. Okay, so we're gonna find that, subtract q of t, divide by delta, take a limit. That's how we're gonna approach this, this derivative. Okay, the old fashioned way. All right, so uh, what's that? Well, the first step is just kind of plugging in. So that's gonna be the log of uh, qi at t plus delta. Okay, so the set of Qs is not, the set of I's is not changing. It's just the individual QIs that are changing. Okay. Um, all right, and we know how those are changing because they're all following Poisson processes and with probability delta times tau, they're gonna jump up by a factor lambda. Okay. So the way we would write that is you know, from zero to one, let's just like a big bracket here. So, so, so at the individual I level, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Actually, yeah, I mean, okay. The, the, the idea here is that it's like a, a probability versus population share thing. At the individual I level, the probability that it jumps is delta tau, and the probability that it doesn't jump is one minus delta tau. But that means when we integrate it, a fraction delta tau will jump and a fraction one minus delta tau will not jump. Okay, we can just show that directly, okay? Because, um, so we're integrating this whole thing. Basically, think you know for a, for a given uh, i. Okay, we're gonna get. Uh, let me think. We're gonna get if it jumps. And I guess here I need to. Then it's gonna be this. Okay, so if it jumps, it's what it was before times lambda. So it's what it was at q of t, q i of t times lambda. Okay. And if it doesn't jump, which happens with probability one minus delta times tau, it's just going to be what it was. It, it hasn't changed. Okay. So for an individual i, we're, we're interpreting that as probability, and then we integrate that. Okay. But then, like, because of the linearity of the integral, these probabilities are also population shares. Okay. And that's where we're going to implicitly be uh, showing this with this one, with either in the next step or the one after that. Okay. So, so here we're, we're getting there. Okay. Um, now the question is how do you know, how do we proceed algebraically? Well, you know, the, basically the, the, the properties of the logarithm are going to be useful here. 
Okay, so in particular, think about this lambda here. We can pop off the lambda. We can break that log of lambda times qi into O log of lambda plus O log of qi. Okay, and then when what we're left with is like a delta t, delta tau times log of qi plus one minus delta times log of qi. We're going to basically get out a qi again. Okay, so we're going to get whatever from zero to one. Okay, so we're going to get delta tau times the log of lambda. Okay. Plus delta tau times the log of qi plus one minus delta tau times the log of qi, which really just means plus the log of qi at t. See that? So we just we when we break off the log, kind of because of the, that that linear separation, then those tau is on the right hand side just going to glob back together, and you get log of qi at t. Okay, so that's sort of the critical step there. Once we've done that, then we're golden, right? So, so you know, factor you know that that addition into two integrals. Okay, the left-hand integral. Well, it's it's, it's the integral of a constant over a, a unit um, interval, uh, and that's so that's just going to be itself delta tau log of lambda. And the right-hand side integral, well, it's the integral from zero to one of log of qi to t di. That's just the log of qi at t. Sorry, the log of q. That's the log of all of q because we're, you know, the integral of log of qi at t. That's just log of q of t. Again, remember on the, the uh, left-hand side here, we have the log of q of t plus delta. Okay, so now we're very close log of q at t plus delta is basically log of q at t plus something times delta. So we can just rearrange this log of q of t plus delta minus the log of q of t over delta. Let's let's even do it over delta is equal to, uh, you know, the log of lambda times tau. Let's switch the order there for some reason, but no, it's equal to the log of lambda times tau. So move that q of t log of q t over, divide by delta, and you get exactly this. Okay. All right. And um, okay, and then so so we and now we take the limit. Okay. And it, I mean the right hand side doesn't even depend on delta, right? So in general, you sometimes, you know, remember with the value function stuff, you, you divide and then you still have some deltas floating around right and, and they disappear on the right hand side here we don't even have delta anymore just by chance kind of um because of the way we did the approximations but even if we did have deltas they they disappear okay but you know take the limit of this that means that you know d log of q dt that's what the limit of of that thing the, the second to last line is is equal to log of lambda times tau okay and that's it. That's 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 the growth rate. Okay, so you know, in sum, g is equal to log of lambda times tau. Okay, so that's our that's our big result there. Okay, so um, so so the idea is basically if you, if you you know th this is a particular case for a particular model, right? Um, it's it's not a, a super general result. It's a result about if you have a log log aggregator like Q. And you have a constant proportional growth rate, uh, sorry, constant proportional jumps happening with size lambda at rate tau. This is what you get. Okay. Now, you know, so if we change the aggregator, let's say it was that epsilon aggregator, the you know the more general one. Well, then it would be different. Okay. It it would actually it would be reminiscent. Okay. And it'd be a little bit trickier in the algebra, but you could you can do it. Um, you'll get something. Um, but it, it wouldn't be this exactly. Okay. Um, you know, if, if the tau varied, actually in the homework, you're going to have a tau that varies by i, right? So this integral is going to be slightly different. It's still doable, okay? Uh, but but it'll be varied by i, and so it, you know, it's going to be a little bit more exciting, all right? Um, and then, uh, yeah, and like the step size can vary too. That. Okay, so, so all these variations are doable. They add complexity to the derivation, but they're basically doable, okay? Um, yeah, and then I guess the other thing is, uh, 
yeah so th this is you know this is a process okay and it's it's one it, there, there are certain rules and patterns that pop out right so just with like the growth rate rules of growth rates you know by now you you guys can probably look at an equation and say okay i, I know what the growth rate of this as long as it's like a, a power type equation you can you can you can kind of piece together what the growth rate is pretty quickly okay you can and you know if, with the value function stuff, okay, you know, you can, once you get the hang of it, you know, you can say, okay, here's the environment, here's the different stuff that can happen. This is what the value is going to look like. I don't need to, to derive this from a discrete limit every time. Okay. And it's kind of the same thing here. You don't, once you get the hang of finding the growth rates of, of these aggregators, you don't necessarily need to do it from the discrete limit. Okay. So, you know, suppose that <clears throat> we had uh, two types of innovation that could occur with rates you know, tau r for radical innovation and tau i for incremental innovation, and they had different step sizes. Essentially, you just add them together, okay? You And you can show kind of just things are linear. You you're, you would just get sort of like the, the the sum of those two growth components as your overall growth rate, okay? So um, there's certain regularities that pop out. Um, they're not like super, super formal, but, but you know, they're, 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 they they become familiar once you get the hang of things, okay? So, um, but but this is good enough for us, okay? Because you know now we have a mapping between from tau, which we had found uh, into g, and all we have to do is is multiply by log tau, by log of lambda, okay? And note that um, you know lambda, remember lambda is, is you know one means that there's no the step size you know, there is no improvement, okay? So when when lambda is one, it makes sense that you know log of one is zero, so you don't get any growth. So if your innovations don't do anything, you don't get any growth. Okay, and similarly, like you don't have any tau if, if there are no innovations happening. Well, yeah, you're not going to get any growth either. Okay, so so it, it makes basic sense. Okay, and then <clears throat> okay, so and then yeah, so here you can see up top, you know, we have tau is uh, gamma r, which is this expression here, and so now we can say, okay, well now we know what g star is. It's just that thing times log of lambda okay so log of lambda i'll write it like this over lambda itself times uh let's use a bracket times uh gamma lambda minus one minus rho okay so that's our that's our growth rate all right um and you remember before we we, we did those we did the comparative statics the the ones for gamma and rho are going to be the same Right, because we're just multiplying by a, a lambda constant. The one for for lambda, remember, we found that the higher your step size, the higher your innovation step size, the more research you're going to do, the more innovation that will occur. Okay, and because we're multiplying by a lot of lambda, which is increasing in lambda, that's still true. That you're you're going to do more innovation, and the innovations will be bigger. Therefore, the growth rate in, in addition is going to be monotone. It's going to be increasing in lambda as well. Okay. So, um, you know, you could see, you know, sometimes with this stuff, it's like, there's a logic of, well, the growth rate's bigger, so we're going to do more research. Therefore, the overall growth level is going to be higher. But the, 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 the inverse logic is like, oh, well, the, the step size is bigger. Well, what if we just did less innovation, but we had bigger step sizes and we could still achieve the same level of growth? Like that. in certain worlds, that logic holds up. In this world, it turns out that logic is not the, the dominant logic. The, the, the dominant logic is that the step size is bigger, therefore you have more incentive to do it. And when you do it, the step size is bigger. And so the combined effect is, a, is an unambiguous positive. Okay, so um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, so so and then, so that, those are the comparative statics and, and you know, you can see, <clears throat> think about um, think about the effect of lambda. Okay, so when, when there's a point at which you hit zero growth, right, with lambda. Once lambda gets low enough that this term here on the right hits zero, that is game over. You, you do zero growth and nothing nothing happens after that, okay? Uh, but if you think about <clears throat> increasing lambda, okay, uh, you're going to, you know, what, like what's the limit for very large lambda? Well, uh it's going to be okay. You know, it's 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 basically going to look like you know the log of lambda times gamma. If you, if you distribute this lambda back, 
Okay, then it'll, it'll look like that. Okay, uh, so then if you think about what's the limit as lambda becomes very large, okay, then, well then it's going to be log of lambda times gamma. Okay, which means maybe I should have just done this in this way, which means that that r is one. As lambda becomes very large because of this monotonicity, eventually r becomes one. When r is one, tau is gamma, right? If you look up here, when r is one, tau is gamma. And if tau is gamma, then the growth rate is log of lambda times gamma. Okay, so you just maxed out on the research, okay, because of the monotonicity, okay? So that's, that's pretty much the whole story, all right? Now, that's in terms of the equilibrium outcomes, okay? Then the other question is, well, is this efficient, okay? And how does, is it uh, too much or too little? Okay, so, so, you know, with the Romer model, we actually, we got some inefficiency, which wasn't the case with Ramsey. So that's fun, okay? But it was always, you did too little innovation in equilibrium, okay? Now, finally, with the Schumpeterian model, we're going to get inefficiency, and it's not even going to be clear, are we doing too much or too little, okay? Because you have this churn, in addition to the old logic of sort of, okay, you're building on each other, and, and you, might, you might be excessively short-sighted because... You only enjoy that profit for a certain amount of time, but but the, the consumer surplus lasts forever. Okay. In addition to that logic, which is sort of Romer style, uh, sort of uh, underinvestment logic, there's also the well, if if you kick someone out, you get the whole market, even though you only improve things by a factor of lambda. Okay. And so you because that churn actually might be inefficient. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and that's we'll see that you might. Depending on this, the basically depending on the size of lambda, you might be doing too much or too little innovation in equilibrium. Okay, but to do that, we need to solve the social planners problem. Okay, uh, but but essentially the social planners problem, this term here up on the oops, this term here up on the top right, the, it, the growth rate is actually going to be exactly that thing in the brackets on the top right, and so you'll you'll be able to talk about the efficiency will be a function of of that lambda coefficient. Of, so so like if the growth rate in the social planner was this and this the growth rate over in the equilibrium is this and the efficiency hinges on whether this thing is greater or less than one okay so we'll be able to talk about the these um the rel you know so the, the efficiency and, and whether it's too high or too low in equilibrium it's a function of parameters and in particular it's going to come down to how is how big is lambda how big is that step size okay because that's going to determine kind of is that churn that too much is it too much churn if land is really small everyone's just scrambling to kick each other out but the net effect isn't that much you're just making these tiny little incremental gains okay but everyone still goes goes wild trying to 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 be be the market leader okay so so that's that's where you can get the inefficient churn is with the small lambda basically okay so so we'll see that okay um next time when we do the social planner okay but uh uh we'll leave it at this for now okay so um yeah, so uh, you you got questions tonight, uh, Sarah's, You know, maybe maybe take a peek at the homework and uh, see if there's anything that seems confusing or anything like that. Um, uh, and and swing by office hours and we can talk about it. All right, but um, if not, you know, have a good weekend and I'll I'll see you guys next week.